Hello, everyone. This is Al-Fadi, and I want to welcome you to episode two of the search for Muhammad. And if you've watched our introduction last time, you would have noticed that we are taking a very unique approach by way of doing a, a historical, if you wish, criticism of the notion that Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, as we know him, existed in a place where the sources of Islam tell us at the time when the sources of Islam indicated, and also went to the places um, that the sources of Islam have taught us. However, many new evidence, discoveries, and even ones from the past are starting to point to a very peculiar set of locations, geographical locations that is, and also historical contradictions. In fact, last time, I thought Dr. J did an excellent job in pointing out the geographical tension between what we're finding today in connection to possibly, let's call him the real Muhammad versus the traditional Muhammad. Vast distances between locations where his biography was established, his hadith began to get compiled, and many other things as well. But on top of this, what I wanted to focus on today, along with Dr. J, is the issue also of the origin of the Quran. With that in mind, Dr. J, what about the Quran? Well, this is the same problem that we found with traditions. Yeah. We talked about the man. We talked about, about the book. You've got to do that. If you're going to talk about the man, you've got to go with the book. And the difficulty with the book itself was best put together by a guy named Dr. Shadi Nasser. Uh, Dr. Shadi Nasser uh, is a graduate, a PhD from Harvard University. He now teaches at Cambridge University. I would suggest in the academic world, he's considered to be probably the foremost on this whole problem of the compilation or well, let's call it the canonization of the Quran. In fact, let me go to the slides and let's just show what we now are finding. Dr. Shadi Nasser uh, did a book back in 2012 where he talked about the five stages of canonization. And these stages, uh, he's saying, existed from within the traditions they tell us about these so we can actually uh, put them out there for people to understand. But he didn't say that he said what people aren't doing is they're not looking at these each one of these canons to realize a completely different Quran has been introduced in every one of these stages. Let's look at the first one, uh, which is the one we're all we're familiar with. And this is the Uthmanic recension, 652. Uh, that's what the Islamic traditions claim. Right. Fascinating, he's writing a book per canon. He hasn't written a book about this first one. Why do you think he hasn't written a book about this first one? Well, I mean, it's, it's quite possible uh, he doesn't have um, evidence or manuscript evidence of that collection. Maybe there is uh, some questions about the um, origin of the story itself. Um, it could exactly, be a and that's the problem. Yeah. There is just nothing to go to. It's yeah. a complete blank. Isn't that interesting? It's the very same problem we're having with all the traditions earlier, with everything we know about Muhammad. We just can't find anything in the seventh century. You've heard Muslim after Muslim claim that they can trace the Quran all the way back to Uthman, and then I always I remember every time that come up there, I said, okay, where is that that archetype? Where is that? quintessential Quran that you're always talking about, and they always start to refer, well, they talk about the seven readings, and they talk about the uh, Nafi, and Ibn Kathir, and Abu Amr, and Ibn Amir, and they talk about Asim, and Hamza, and Kasai. Hold on a minute, those aren't from the, this is not from that time period, this is not from the seventh century. That's the second canonization, and that's what Shadi Nasr, the second canonization from Ibn Mujahid. Let's look at the slide there. There, Ibn Mujahid, look at the date that we have from Ibn Mujahid. That's 936. That's the 10th century. Now, 10th century is 300 years after Muhammad. Right. And he's introducing these seven readings. They're called readings. Right. Fascinating. Look at the earliest. I've got it right here. This is the earliest one, this one right here. These are four of the 30 that exist. But this one here is by Ibn Amir. And this is the earliest of all of the Qira'at, the seven readings that, are, that and we'll have more that come afterwards. Look at his date, 736. Right, and I want to emphasize two things. Ibn Mujahid supposedly canonized these different readings when? 300 years after the supposed canonization by Uthman because of the different readings. Because of the different yeah, readings. That's number one problem. Number two, the earliest out of all of those come actually from north, 
not from Mecca or Medina. This is from Damascus. Exactly. That's 1,200 miles further north. Right. And people aren't looking at the time period and they're not looking at a map. You've got, we did that with the traditions. We looked at a map and we looked at a timeline. Correct. 736, Muhammad died in 632. This is 100 years later that this is introduced and this is the earliest. Of the seven that were chosen by Ibn Mujahid in 936, uh, they go start from 736 and go all the way up to 805. 805 is the 9th century. So these are 8th and 9th century readings. But this is not all. Because then you have another guy. Uh, let's go up to the slide again and let's go to the third canon. And this is where he's introducing this other third canon. Now, how would you pronounce his name? Uh, Shatabi. Shatabi. Let's make sure you get it correct. Otherwise, I'll desecrate it with my American English, <laughs> my American uh, Arabic. So, uh, Shatabi, he then takes and realizes that there were many, so many Qurans that were being introduced. According to Dr. Shadi Nasser, he says that there could be as, now he doesn't use the, the, the number. I'm looking and just from all the inferences, there could be as many as 700 of these. 700 of these different, what we know as riwayats. These are different readings, different Qur'ans. Really, they're all and, different. And, and the word riwayat is a, a peculiar, by the way, from an Arabic standpoint. It's almost like your storytelling. And that's exactly what they yeah, are. Exactly. So here he takes every one of these seven readings that Ibn Mujahid had introduced in the tenth century. Sorry, the tenth century, nine thirty six. He introduces. Look at his date, eleven ninety four. That's the late twelfth century. Late twelfth century. He introduces two for each one of the readers. That now you have fourteen. So the chain now. He's establishing the chain of narration. Ter chain of narration. The right. transmitters. Right. The riwayat. We are now up to twenty one. You think that would be too many, right? No, there's still more. Because there's I thought it's one, right? <laughs> that's right. There's supposed to be only one. Isn't that what Uthman did at the very beginning? Only had one and, and right. he burned all the others? That's right. Let's go and see what Shadi Nasr does. Shadi Nasr, well, there's a fourth canon, and here's the fourth canon, Al-Jazari, or Jazari, however you want to pronounce it. Al-Jazari, yeah. And Jazari, he then introduces three more readings of the readers. Each of those has two transmitters, the riots, and these are now six, so three plus six equals nine. Add to the seven plus 14, we have 21. That makes now 30 readings. But look at his date, 1429, that is the 15th century. And, and notice what he did. He added thro three more canonized readings. How in the world did he know about these canonized readings that even Ibn Mujahid did not include? or that al shatabi didn't even include. But you're talking about three of the ones that were above the seven. That's and right. remember, Yasser al-Qadi always said this over and over. These are the creme de la creme. These are the best of the best, these 10. These 10. And he's referring to Nafi, Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Ibn Amir, Asim, Hamza al-Qasai, Abu Jafar, Yaqub, and Khilaf. Those are the 10 right there. I've just given you them. I've just given you them. What's missing in that list? What's missing in that list? Missing. Huff, uh, Huff's, uh, you know, Huff's the, the is one missing. that everybody uses. Everyone uses today right. is this guy. Right. Where is this guy in that list? Right. Well, if this is the creme de la creme, the top, the best of the best, the 10 readers, he is not there. I Interestingly, mean, when did he come in? Well, actually, he was introduced by our good friend Al Shatabi. He was the one, it was not introduced till the 12th century. He right. is from 796, but he is introduced in 1194. Officially acknowledged. Acknowledged. By yeah. Then that's fascinating. Right. Let me ask you this: When you do, when you ever you uh, are looking at manuscripts or anything that has come out of the desert or they found in a museum or uh, whenever they find a new manuscript, what is the first thing you do with a biblical manuscript to see if it's authoritative or not? Well, obviously they do a lot of things. You know, they want to look at the dating. They want to make sure it compares to what we have today. That's important. Mm. Well, how do you do that? Well, compares. you look at earlier manuscripts. Well, you open it up, right? Exactly. You would open and up. And you compare. In and fact, you you're do a textual criticism. This is called textual criticism. So what you would do, you would take this manuscript. Now, this is Ibn Amir's. And you would open it up and you would read the text, right? That's what we do with the biblical manuscript. Yeah, and show, please, uh, the, the, the reason behind these color codes, you know. I want people to see there are differences. It's telling you. It's telling this you. is it's red different the than the Huff's one. Okay, but that's something we found today. Right. When this was first introduced, did they do that? No, because if Huff's was original, they could have discovered that. Okay, so that look, is looking back to a standard. That's right. So this is a modern reference point. That means there has to be a standard, which means they at least opened up the book and read the words. Except they did it a couple of hundred years later. A couple of hundred years later, when they started with this guy, Ibn Amir or Nafi or Ibn Kathir or Abu Ahmad, did they, do, did they open up one book and read it? 
No. It doesn't look like it. So how did they choose these seven readers? How did Ibn Mujahid choose these seven weird readers? How did Al-Shatabi choose the next 14? And how did yeah. Al-Jazari choose the next nine? I'm going to use your own terminology, popularity contest. It was a popularity contest. Yeah. They didn't do any textual criticism. They didn't look at anything to see whether or not it fit to that which came earlier, which is what you would think would happen. That's what proper textual criticism is. Yeah. They didn't do anything like that. They basically looked to see how many students they had, how many people came after them. Basically, whoever had the longest number of chains of, uh, of students, they were chosen. They were chosen, but that's not all. Look, look, look at this one here. This is the second most popular one. This is called the Wash. This is known and used all over North Africa. How was this chosen? When this was chosen by al Shatabi, why did he choose this guy? Do you know what the reason is behind this? Because he didn't have very many change of names. He was in Cairo, I think. Now, in fact, there were two others, Ismail bin Jafar and al Musayabi, who are both in Medina, who, whereas where the, these Supposedly are from Nafi. Supposedly Muhammad, right? You know, That's Bashar bin Quraishi. Yeah. They were both in Medina, but he is not from Medina. Cairo. And they had much more, many more students to come after them. So why weren't they chosen? And why did he choose so he this guy? He lived in Al-Fustat, known as Al-Qahira. Right? There you go. Yeah. He was from a city that had not been chosen yet. Right. He was from Egypt, from Cairo or Al-Fustat. I have to keep doing that now yeah. because yeah. I'm going to have Yasser Qadi hammering all over the place. You don't know what the name oh, is. Don't worry. We're doing a deep dive, Dr. Qadi. We're doing Qadi. a deep dive now. Yeah. When you go yeah. back and look at, the, if that's yeah. the reason he was chosen, just because he came from a city that had not been chosen yet, they wanted to make sure they got that city included in all these riwayats. Does that, is that how you choose textual uh, or manuscript evidence or Qur'ans or, in this case, the greatest of all revelations? You know, Jay, it's almost like you telling me, uh, don't watch this guy's channel because they have less followers than me. Has nothing to do with the content, right? You know, I mean, it's 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 almost sound like this. There has been no textual critical analysis done on yeah. any of these. Nonetheless, by the, look at the date, 1429, that's the 15th century. You're talking about 800 years after Muhammad. They finally got the 30 that they wanted. These are the 30 that were all chosen because of how popular they were or where they lived. Nothing to do with textual criticism. Now they have 30. How many times have you been uh, been asked, how is it we can trust Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Because you have four different uh, gospels of one event or one person's life and what he said and what he did. Now, how can we trust four? Why don't you have one? We have one Quran. No, you don't have one Quran. You have 30 official Qurans. Not one of them come from the time that Muhammad lived. Notice none of these even introduced. The first one that's even written down is a whole hundred years after the fact. That's 736. They go all the way up until 905. From right. 736 up to 905, that is up until the, the 10th century, from the 8th century, hundreds of years later, and hundreds of miles away. We're going to talk about that a little later. And, and I want to add something. I mean, it, it baffles me, I mean, I truly mean it, when I hear so-called scholars who actually buy into this as a authentic source to authenticate the Quran that we have today, to authenticate the so-called the Uthmanic Rasm, the Uthmanic collections. Well, in our case, all of these gospel accounts are eyewitness accounts. Right. Eyewitness account. None of these is eyewitness. Okay, well, two of them are eyewitnesses, and two have got it from the eyewitnesses. You're talking about the gospel accounts. Now, yep. let's uh, let's just go through this. You, uh, this became a real problem. Uh, uh, Shadi Nasser talks about this, because look, we only have four canons there. We, he said there were five canons. So what about the fifth canon? This became a huge problem in Cairo in the 20th century. There in Cairo... They had a problem with high schoolers because the high schoolers were coming to do standardized testing and as they were writing references about the Quran and they were writing what they had memorized, they were writing verse by verse by verse, the people who were, to, uh, who were examining the test said, we, we can't make sense of this because there's 30 different uh, different ways of saying the same thing. Right. How do you standardize the test? You can't with 30 different Qurans with saying, saying 30 different things. So they went to a man named Muhammad Ibn al Husseini al Haddad, who is a scholar at Al Azhar University there in Cairo. And they said, Could you choose one of them? Could you just choose one of them out of these 30? So he chose this one. He right. chose this one. This is Huff's Quran. And where does Huff come from? He comes from Kufa. Kufa is in Iraq. Iraq Another is not northern 
location. Another northern. We're going to get to that in the next yeah. uh, uh, next episode. So he is he chose one that was didn't even come from where the Kodeshi dialect was introduced. But the, he doesn't even choose the guy that should have. He should have chosen. He should have either chosen Nafi or Ibn Kathir or or at least Abu Jafar, those three, exactly. or their students, or their transmitters from those three. Mecca, Medina, you know. Mecca or Medina, because yeah. that's the Kode that is where the Qureshi dialect would have been spoken. That's where Muhammad lived, and that's why Uthman chose that one and burned all the others. He burned all the ones from Basra. He burned all the ones from Kufa. He burned all the ones from Damascus and only retained the ones that he had there, Mecca, Medina. And what does... Muhammad al hidad do? He chooses the wrong one. He chooses this one, which has nothing to do with Medina. Is way up in Iraq, in Kufa, and this guy was known as a liar. And this guy was known as a cheat. We have seven traditions about him, right? Seven different ones that yeah. we have today. Exactly. Because there were many differences. Now there have been many changes between right. 1924 and 1936 when they, they did decide to make it Egypt-wide. And that's why it is known, uh, that one is, is, is known as the 1936 rendition. There were many changes. They had to make many changes. And that's why we have, up, at least Hattun has been able to collect seven of them. Now, that is the fifth canon. That is the fifth canon. Bring it back down to one. What did they do with all the other 29? Now, I said this once before, and Yosef Qadri really attacked me last week for saying, Jay, do you going to say that they took all the Qurans that were in the world, that they disagreed, and threw them into the Nile? No. Let me just say on camera again, they, no one said they took all the Qurans in the world. They took all those high schoolers' Qurans that disagreed, that they didn't want them to use anymore. Just in Cairo, all the high school Qurans that they had been using to, uh, to answer their test questions, and they took those out to a boat and they dumped it into the Nile, thinking that that would solve the problem. And as I said in the year and a half ago when I made that video that Yasakati tried to attack, isn't it interesting that they thought they could get rid of it by doing that? That's not how you get rid of Qurans. Yeah. You don't burn them. You don't sink them. You don't secrete them, secrete them or decrete them. You don't sit there and rub and ru uh, erase them or try to impose letters into them like Dan Brubaker is finding. That's not going to change it, yeah. folks. That's not going to do enough. And you don't delete it off the Internet like Yasakati does. And what I want to say uh, also, you can do what Uthman did because regardless of whether Uthman burned all of them some of them he didn't delete them he did not eradicate them we still have variant readings that lasted all the way until the time of 1925 okay let's talk <coughs> about that in the next I mean, episode because yeah. the next episode we're going to move into that and that's so important because once we get to the next episode i want to unpack there are problems with every one of these canons but can you see shadi nasser who is now, the Muslims don't want to deal with him because he's such an intellect, he's such an academic. You don't touch him because of the fact that he is actually going back to the original tradition and he's just bringing him down to layman's terminology so we can read them and then we can use them. I want to unpack and show you there are problems with every one of these canons. And for that, we are really thankful for the work that people like Dr. Shadi Nasser do, your work, Robert Spencer's work, and Dr. Brubaker's and others as well. Mm. Brother, thank you so much. We can't wait, of course, until uh, we hear more uh, in the next episode. And everybody, hopefully you're enjoying uh, this amazing series. I assure you that you are going to hear a lot of groundbreaking information and data that you are not going to hear anywhere else outside of my channel and uh, Vanderfilm's channel, and hopefully others will begin to spread that type of news. Till we meet again, have a blessed day.